Alan K 啊，是我们大家都非常熟悉的图灵奖的获得者。我们也是先看一个简短的对他们俩的介绍视频。张洪江博士，北京致远人工智能研究院理事长，国际多媒体和人工智能研究领域的领军科学家。由于在多媒体研究领域开拓性贡献，他荣获2010年 IEEE 技术成就奖、2012年 ACM 多媒体技术成就奖。因其在研发和技术转换方面的杰出贡献。2008被授予美国杰出亚裔工程师奖，他已发表近400篇学术论文，拥有近200项国际专利，是中国大陆计算机领域 H Index 影响因此最高的科学家。2011年，他加入金山，任集团执行董事及 CEO， 兼任金山云的首席执行官以及猎豹移动、迅雷及世纪互联的董事。2016年12月，从金山退休。之后加盟元码资本任投资合伙人，张洪江博士曾担任微软亚太研发集团首席技术官及微软亚洲工程院院长，微软第一批十位杰出科学家，微软亚洲研究院创始人之一，并任副院长。二零一八年十一月起，他担任北京致远人工智能研究院理事长。Alan K。出生于1940年，父亲是位设计一支的生理科学家，母亲是位音乐家。他从小生长在一个科学和艺术共存的环境。他说自己至今仍不区分科学和艺术。他三岁就能流畅阅读，但他觉得这既是种幸运，也是种不幸，因为他没上学就已读完150本书，因此知道老师总是欺骗自己。从犹他大学毕业后。他在斯坦福人工智能实验室工作，之后在施乐研究中心工作了十年。这段时间，他发展了计算机图形界面和面向对象编程，并因此获得2003年图灵奖。Alan K 对未来怀着清晰浪漫的愿景，他能想象未来应该是什么样，并且努力让其实现。他说自己最喜欢的一句话是：“我们越来越快地驶向未来。”却试图仅靠后视镜来控制方向。好的，啊、哎，那我把这个就转给，有请这个洪江和 Alan。好，谢谢刘江。Hello， Hi Alan， Welcome to the BAAI、uh, 2 0 2 0 conference。And I, I,、uh, we are going to have this,、uh, you know, almost an hour to talk about.、Uh, A few things you you lately、uh, is、uh, are very、uh, enthusiastic about. In particular, you know you you have this、uh, particular note on how the big how. So uh, uh, I I assume you have a presentation first, and now let's go to the presentation. Then we will come back、uh, with our dialogue. Okay, I'm going to need to share my screen. Sure. There we go. That working? Yes. Perfect. Okay. Okay. So uh, this is uh, just a few notes to help uh, lead us into the discussion, which is the main point of this. And these five topics and questions were ones that were part of the context I was given for this little talk and discussion. And in order to uh, Help.、Uh, we all felt that this、uh, white paper I wrote last year for the MacArthur Foundation here in、uh, the UK, which is all about large challenges,、uh, and they were interested in how are some really large challenges dealt with in the past, and is something that can we learn for it? Can we help educate the politicians? So. I'm presuming most people haven't read this, so I picked a few things from this、uh, here、uh, on the screen as one of the <clears throat> URLs to get this, but possibly the URL is already 
been um, sent around. So anyway, uh, this is a white paper uh, looking at some of the big maximum efforts on intense critical challenges in the past. And when I think about these things, I always try and think about what's the larger culture that any problem uh, is embedded in because the larger surround often gets lost. And for the stuff I think about, I always start with humans and all of the cultures on the planet. So we have several thousand cultures. And within these cultures, and we are in ours, besides all the things that we're doing, we have duties to society. Those are things we need to think about when we're allocating our time. We all have duties to bringing up the next generation of children, whether we have children or not. There are worldviews we have to deal with. Most of the disagreements between people of goodwill comes from them actually having different worldviews. And we sort of think that people have the same worldview as we do, but we don't. So we have to take that into consideration. We have to understand what schooling is and what it should be. There's this idea of richness where it's not about work, it's not about duties. Richness is expanding our ability to have an emotional connections to things. And then uh, there's this problem of how do we get from day to day with our, our basic needs. So these are uh, six, seven things uh, that I treat as a context. And especially for here, but also the way I think about things, I think of these as being embedded in uh, large issues. And I just picked um, 12 of them. So you can pick your favorite one. The problem is all 12 of them have been let to get into disastrous uh, straits. So we really have to work on all 12 of them. And that's one of the big problems is how not to get distracted. For instance, we have a health problem, which is very important. People are not doing well at it, but it's also distracting from other issues that have to do with the planet, like the planet itself is starting to die in various ways. And so another issue that's hiding there that's going to have a much bigger impact on human beings than the, the pandemic is going to be the, the climate problem. And if we imagine a child being born this year, well, at the end of the century, they'll be only be 80. They'll still be alive. We have to wonder, how are they going to get there? Could they get there with the planet in better shape than it is now rather than in worse shape? So one of the biggest problems here is imagination and using conventional thinking. So Einstein, one of my favorite lines from Einstein is, we cannot solve our problems with the same levels of thinking that we use to create them. So however we got here, whatever we think of as normal, which is how we got here, it's not going to work to get us past this to fix these things. And so right away, one of our biggest issues is to deal with stuff that is outside of what our society thinks is normal. And people use the term crazy for stuff that's outside of normal. So that's what we have. We have to learn how to be crazy in really good ways. And the thing that comes along with this is if you haven't learned how to think skillfully and to realize where you are requires strong thinking, you are in big trouble. And this is where most of the human race is. 
So here's where most people think we are. Some memory from childhood in the past. If we take this as the planet, it's no longer so green. It's really kind of like this. But in fact, we have these glasses on, so we can't see even where things are now. And the problem is we have to imagine into the future what's likely to happen on the current set of things. Now, it could be the future of the pandemic. I'm picking the climate as a big thing. So we have to be able to deal with all three of these views at the same time. And the problem is that science is our imagination amplifier, but most people aren't scientists, especially most politicians. Most of the voting public in the United States are not scientists or in the UK. And they do not like thinking outside their normal. On the other hand, what has happened over the years is that every time there has been a threat that is recognized by the general public, including the politicians, there's usually a big response to it. War is the favorite one. Because it should be epidemics too, but most people are not taking COVID seriously at this point. Few places have, but most, most places haven't, especially uh, my country, two countries, US and the UK, really haven't taken it seriously. So if we look in the past here to uh, big projects, all of them have had some sort of threat involved with them. I stuck the Empire State Building there because it's one of my favorite engineering projects ever. The, the whole building from the uh, raising of the site, the demolishing of the previous site to occupancy was less than a year. And it was done by less than uh, 3,000 people. It's one of the great building and designing and planning jobs in history. And the reason it was done that way was because uh, the depression, Great Depression in the US had hit the very year this got funded. So part of the motivation here is we have to get this thing up in a hurry. And another part of the motivation is let's show everybody what building a tall building is really like because another one like this is not gonna be built for decades. So the other uh, entries here, which are all described in this white paper are from World War II and the Cold War. So Atomic Energy, Bletchley Park, the UK and US joint project on radar, which was the prime technology for World War II. And then a lot of funding continued from the, in the Cold War. And part of that funded ARPA 1957, and ARPA funded a, an agency to do uh, non-structured uh, research, research that was not top-down, looking into information systems. And Xerox PARC was one of these groups just funded by Xerox about 10 years later. So, the process of this uh, right-hand panel in the Cold War came out of what the group doing radar learned about how to do science and engineering together on a large scale to combine research into the unknown with doing practical engineering. <clears throat> so most of the successes in the realm of computers uh, research in the US, many of them, came out of uh, the process and it was taught to grad students uh, generation after generation. So a key thing about this kind of unrestricted spending without a lot of top-down supervision, that a, a key thing that is missed is the 
amount of wealth that came out of doing this spending was spent to deal with a war. But in fact, the most of the industries in the US that happened after World War II happened because of World War II. Most of the technologies that are prominent today came about because of World War II. And so an incredible amount of wealth has been generated far, far more than what the outlay. There was no need for wars to do this at all. But that's just the way we are. And to give you a sense here, PAR came out of the ARPA community. ARPA research started uh, in 1962. So there are 12 to 14 years to get the payoff. Uh, and the larger community started before. Here's a larger look at uh, the DOD ARPA merging into PARC. Uh, the two groups from PARC came out of the ARPA community. Uh, the internet was a joint project. Um, and most of the technologies that we did at PARC came out of prior research at ARPA, including some of our PhD theses. And if we take an even closer look at PARC, we can see most of the familiar technologies that we're still using today that I'm using to give this talk. And so we call it eight and a half inventions. The half is the internet. Amazingly, all of this was done by about two dozen researchers, just 25 researchers for, the, for these inventions. Really inexpensive, about $15 million a year in today's dollars. Cheap. Return so far has been over $40 trillion. And this created industries rather than increments. So there's prior art in all of these things, but each of these created industries of their own. And the largest valuations in the stock market of American companies came about because of these inventions. So what's interesting is crazy funding of research that nobody believes in. And believe, it, believe me, nobody did when we were at Park. They thought we were crazy. If you are funding people who are up to the task and you're willing to take 30% of the results, you're gonna get an enormous return just monetarily, but also you're gonna get an even bigger return for society. And that's what we're talking about today. So people say, well, Xerox didn't make any money on this, but in fact, they made billions on the laser printer and paid for park many, many times over, 50 or 60 times over at least. Okay, so here's the key point. And that is, if you're interested in doing this, the goodness of the results you're going to get correlates most strongly with the goodness of the funders. And this is not in terms of money. Most funding today in the United States is not good funding in the terms I'm using good here. It's mainly funding for uh, goals picked ahead of time. It's done top down. It has making money as an end result and so forth. So what I mean by goodness of the funders here is the funders actually understand this other process, which we're talking about today, of how do you get stuff that hasn't been seen before. And here's one of the great ones of all time, the guy who set up the ARPA IPTO funding in 1962, and he was a visionary. And he would not talk about goals. He did not have goals. He had visions. And a vision is something that gives you a, a sense of what the thing, what the desire is, but nothing specific. There's nothing you can work on directly. You have to pick the problems from the vision. So here is his vision that set off all of this stuff. Computers are destined to become interactive intellectual amplifiers for everyone, university, universally networked worldwide. That's all he would ever say. And when they asked, well, how are you gonna do this? He said, well, I don't know, but I'm just gonna give money to people that think they can help. 
and we'll take a percentage of the results. And given what we're trying to fund, if 30 or 40 percent of the results are successful, we will change the entire world. And that is exactly what happened. So, so these visions, they're kind of like little magnetic fields hidden behind the, the mountains. Researchers can feel these magnetic fields. And if you're over on this side, you can feel north, uh, feel the magnet going this way. And if you're over on this side, you can feel the magnet going. Everybody starts moving towards the magnet. And you get a lot of different ways of approaching what this vision is. And that is what happened. So whenever you get into trouble, what you need to do is to realize that most problem statements come out of the current context, but most of the solutions you need come out of a context that has to be invented. So you need to retreat from goals and problems to visions, visions of how things should be, and those will help think wider. So how did this stuff work back then? Well, there's the Pentagon, Department of Defense, and there's the US Congress. Every country has something like this. In 1957, the Russians put up a satellite and scared people. And that fear was enough to set up the Advanced Research Projects Agency in 1957. And these were the days of the Cold War. And so instead of putting bureaucrats in there, all the ARPA directors were scientists, mostly physicists. And in 1962, they funded the information processing techniques part of ARPA, also stocked with scientists and a new guy every two years. The idea is if you stay in too long, it becomes your job. No, your job is to be a scientist and what you're doing is doing service. So you do two years of service helping the country and then you go back. Otherwise you start buying a house and get a house mortgage and you start worrying about your job and losing your job. And now, of course, Congress still wanted to be a watchdog. They wanted to be the top down. So they'd all ask, well, how is this relevant? Tell me why this work that you're doing is relevant to the Department of Defense. And unlike today, these guys would tell Congress, no, that's not the right question to ask because they didn't care about getting fired. No, that's not the right question to ask. The right question is how is this going to help the country or this technology or our society or our culture generally. And by the way, these are direct quotes. And Bob Taylor, who was an onlooker there said, well, they'd stand up to the Congress and in a polite civilized way, attack their nearsightedness, their myopia, because they were scientific statesmen. So Bob talked to Charlie Hertzfeld here Charlie said, well, what do you want, Bob? And Bob said, well, this network is what I want to do. This is like 1966, 67. And Hertzfeld didn't ask him what it was. He said, okay. And Bob said, well, that was a 15 minute conversation with my boss. And then uh, Charlie said, well, how much money do you need to get this off the ground? And Bob said, oh, about a million dollars or so, that would be like six or seven million dollars today just to get it started. And uh, Hertzfeld's response was, okay. And as Bob said, there was no ARPA order written, there's no bureaucracy, nothing. The paperwork work was done about a year later, but they were able to start the same day that Bob had this meeting. And that Network that he wanted is called the internet today. Just in case you don't get the joke here. The joke is this is how this thing that we're using that's all over the planet was actually funded without a proposal. Just two people who trusted each other. And it was part of this vision of lick lighters. And what's key to this story besides what happened with ARPA was that Bob then went on to set up com the computing research at Xerox Park. And so he took this way of doing things into this industrial research lab and hired uh, a bunch of us to do the work. So here's a key idea. Being responsible doesn't mean you should try to control. This is the biggest mistake that almost everybody in charge in bureaucracy makes. 
because they are held accountable by their boss and they're buying a house and they're afraid of getting fired. But basically, you can't do it because in the case of unusual research, if you're a funder, you don't know enough to come up with good problems. Believe me, you're in the wrong place and the wrong job. The people who know enough to come up with good problems are out doing research. They're not messing around with money. They're not doing politics. So you just cannot do top down on this stuff and get anything. And it's the great people who come up with the great goals. What you do is support them. So being responsible means you try to manage the support of these people who are thinking about what should be done, realizing that perhaps 60% of their efforts are not going to succeed. And the other thing that ARPA chose to do was to have no peer review. And the reason is that even great people are often poor judges of other people's work just from rivalries or just they're in a different context. It doesn't seem relevant. So peer review just doesn't work at these top levels. It only works for mediocre stuff. Even if you get peers. And in the U.S., like at NSF, NSF, you never get a peer. There are professors here and there who do it, but you never get a peer. So key idea, top-down control kills unusual research. Lots of money gets spent. You'll set up research labs all over the place. People will get hired. People will do things. In the U.S., at least, it has essentially never worked. Bell Labs had a, had a sign all over, going down the stairs on walls. The sign would say, either do something very beautiful or very useful. That was the sign at Bell Labs. Either very beautiful, we don't care if it's useful, or very, very useful. But take it out there and go to one extreme or the other. So what you need here is you need unusual funders, you need unusual research managers, and you need unusual researchers. So back uh, when I was operating uh, in the 60s and 70s, it was ARPA, Office of Naval Research, Xerox, unusual research managers like Licklider, Sutherland, and Taylor. Now the unusual researchers, interestingly enough, are easier to find but they won't do anything without these first two slots being taken care of. So if you want a championship football team, you get a Beckham. You just don't go out and get somebody randomly. You get the best uh, football player in the world and hire him for your team. And if you want to do a Xerox Park, you get a Butler. This is Butler Lamson. Stratospherically able. And if you look at the bell curve here, uh, what you're looking for are people that are for your research labs are one in a hundred thousand, one in a million, one in ten million. Ten, one in ten million. Well, China has 140 of them. Pick something to be unusual in. China has 140 in this almost five sigma case. And if you want to do this stuff, you have to find them and nurture them. And some of the researchers have to be like this. Some of the researchers will be like top scientists. Some of them will be like top engineers. But some of them are going to be like this. And when I'm showing this, this is an ad that I suggested Apple make back 40 years ago as to what personal computing should be about. And what I meant, what I tried to get them to do was to do this. Because the real process here is not to have a domain of right brain and left brain. The real process here is to have the ability to fluidly merge all the different thinking kind, kinds of thinking you have and aesthetic thinking you have into the thinking you're doing. So here's another key point. ARPA spent a lot of money 
growing their next generation of researchers. They consider that one of the main research results, I had to fight Congress on it, but they said, hey, this, doing this vision is going to take 10, 15, maybe 20 years. So we have to, we, we have to grow the next generation of researchers and we can grow them in this vision. And in fact, almost all the computer people at Xerox Park came from this ARPA process. We were all young. I was the oldest person there. I was uh, 30 years old. Everybody else was younger. Butler was only 27. That's what Bob Taylor wanted. He had seen all of us do our PhDs. Okay, last idea here is this idea of mad money. <clears throat> mad money is money that you have in your pocket that you spend on a whim. You can spend it on something that might not even wind up working and you don't care. It's money that is not aimed at any purpose. So the number one thing you have to ask is, in any organization or country, is how much mad money is there? Now, if you have a country that is super duper organized, they will tell you, we have no mad money. We plan for every cent. We can tell you where we spend every cent on this and we'll show you in the master plan. Where the, okay, so that's not very creative. And most uh, companies want to show the stockholders that they've been spending this money wisely and here's the return on this investment. They hate to show line items where there's no return on investment for five years. Okay, so mad money. So here's the way to compute it for a company. Uh, R&D in a company is usually five to 15% of revenues. Most of it goes towards product. Mad money is 1% to 5% of that. So the range here is about, uh, you know, it's just tiny fractions of uh, our total revenues in a company. And if Xerox Park was about $15 million a year today, that means that taking the stingiest approach to this, we're, we're only gonna take 5% of revenues for R&D and 1% of that for mad money. Still, the first 14, uh, Fortune 418 com com companies are gonna to afford to do a Xerox Park. Not a single one of them have, no matter how much money they have. And if you go to the higher end, 15% of revenues like technology companies do, and you're gonna spend 5% of that on the R, on the uh, mad money, like Xerox did, that means every single one of the uh, Fortune 500, Fortune 1000, uh, companies. So let's look at it for countries. So if we start with, say, Japan and Germany or so, large countries on up spend 100 billion to 500 billion for country R&D. I think China is, is about 240 or 250 billion dollars a year. The U.S. is uh, maybe closer to 500 or something, but it's about 2%, whatever it is, it's around 2% of the uh, GNP. And so if we take the same mad money figure, one to 5%, the mad money for the lower end is 1 billion a year to 5 billion a year of stuff you should spend without worrying about what happens. So like Japan should be spending a billion dollars a year without worrying about what happens. And so a billion dollars a year is 66 Xerox parks. Seems like should do it, right? And for a large company like uh, China or the US, it's over 300 to over 1600 Xerox parks for each country. And what this means is that the world collectively, and especially the large uh, countries, getting their act together 
actually have plenty of funding and they have plenty of potential talent to actually deal in an unconventional way with these enormous problems we have. The problem is, is that most of the people in the world cannot see that we have these problems or cannot see them as threats or fears or whatever it takes. And so I'll leave you with the final quote by Einstein here, which is, insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. That's what's been going on for the last 40 or 50 years in computing, for sure. And um, I dare say in most things, and most especially for these 12 critical issues that we have to deal with right now. So thank you very much. And I guess that was about a half an hour rather than what I promised, but that's just the way I talk. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Alan, for the great talk and very, very enlightening. The, uh, uh, what, what you just uh, you know, uh, talked about, uh, a large part of it, you actually summarized very well in your note, uh, The Big How. And uh, you actually list uh, the, uh, you know, 19 rules of uh, R&D management to solve immense uh, world challenges. And, but you also mentioned, you also actually summarized very well, but you didn't uh, mention your talk, is that there are tremendous barriers <coughs> for people to follow through your advice. And that, that 19 rules, including, you know, give the money, leave people alone. And uh, the, the mad money, and give the mad money, and the last uh, great people do the great thing, and don't ask them how much they have the progress they have made. And uh, but people just couldn't do it. So uh, you mentioned about these barriers, and you have this concept of six core buyers in the so-called ostrich paradox. Could you talk about that a little bit? Well. So a good a good place, good reference for all this is uh, the Wikipedia article that is called Cognitive Biases. I should have put that up in a slide, Cognitive Biases. And it lists, I guess, probably closer to 200 things that are wrong with human brains. So this is the result of anthropology and psychology over the last few hundred years, one of the things that people have been interested in is uh, why are we such poor thinkers? Why do we require so much training to do uh, good thinking? Why was science only invented a few hundred years ago instead of 100,000 years ago and so forth? And so there are many, so uh, something that every scientist knows about is called confirmation bias. So when you have a theory, confirmation bias, and scientists do it too, is any evidence that will strengthen the thing you already believe, you give it much more weight than evidence against the thing you already believe. It really costs people something to unbelieve something. And of course, in science, you're not supposed to believe things, but we do anyway. So the ostrich syndrome, we've seen it in uh, responses to the pandemic. Well, it's not there, it's not important. Uh, well, even if it is there, we can't do anything about it. Uh, so all of these things are, they're expansions of one of the things that is deeply built into all mammals. In fact, probably most animals uh, that can move is when you're in trouble, Basically, you should either find a place to hide from it, or you should prepare to fight. So it's called fight or flight. Right. And this extends yeah. in right. the way people deal with things verbally. So it's, it's a part of human nature, and people are willing to get past their human nature when they're really frightened, like in a war. Yeah. And uh, you mentioned that that people, you know, when people really get threatened, the uh, and also you 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 know you, you, the uh, the story you mentioned about how you know DAPA today, what we call it, the APA that time, 
uh, started was uh, because of Cold War, because uh, the, uh, the threat people felt from the uh, Soviet Union at that time, and also the fact that uh, Soviet is launched a satellite. So, uh, uh, you know, when, when people sense this danger, then they may start to act and act in the right way, uh, you know. So uh, the, uh, my question is, it's pandemic, you know, in the last four months, uh, five months now, you know, has caused the world so much trouble, you know, economic wise and uh, people life wise, you know, is that a big enough threat that you think, you know, can waken people up and uh, start doing things uh, in the right way? Doesn't seem to be. Um, has depended on uh, how the government uh, governments have been structured. Like New Zealand did the right thing and did it quickly. Uh, the U.S. didn't do the right thing and is doing the wrong thing still. Um, um, and is going in another wave of it. So, but I think overall, the uh, expecting, uh, you know, mainstream people to do the right thing here. They just can't imagine it until, for instance, maybe a relative gets it. So when a relative gets the disease and maybe dies from it or has a terrible time with it, or they do, then they have this local way of assessing things. Right. But for war is prevalent in human history. And so the threat of war uh, has been enough in the past. For instance, it was enough to get radar started in, uh, in the UK uh, seven or eight years ahead of the Battle of Britain. Yeah, and the rest of the country did not believe that there was going to be a war with Germany, and the politicians were trying to avoid it. But the people who did the radar did it anyway, and uh, Britain came out on top when the Nazis did fly over. So that uh, that was a reaction of what you might call eccentrics who had some funding, who had the ears of some people, but it was certain. Radar was not a national priority in the UK, nor was Bletchley Park, uh, until there was an actual shooting war. But both of them had been set up ahead of time. Similarly, in the United States, there was a billionaire yeah. who got radar started in the US because the government wouldn't fund it, and he didn't care. He happened to also be a physicist, and he also funded the start of the joint project with, uh, with MIT before the US was officially in the war. So that made an enormous difference, but uh, you can't give the US government any points. Con you can't give Congress any points for uh, reacting to what was actually going on. The US in those days was completely isolationist. Yeah. Okay, uh, let's uh, you know, go back a little bit. You know, you know, we have, you have talked about the, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, Kind of a history of uh, modern computer science development you know, from the DARPA days, and uh, uh, I, just say, I just I just say one thing: when ahead. the D went, when the D the D was put onto ARPA, yeah, it wasn't ARPA anymore. Okay, so just because I, just yeah. because ARPA has ARPA in it okay. means nothing because what that when the D got put on. The processes that had been going on before got changed. So, uh, and, that, you know, what you meant, meant is that, yeah, today. It was, it, it was that D and the processes changed that got Taylor to try and get money from a company, and that's how Xerox Park happened. Uh, okay. That's okay. the important thing. Xerox Park happened because of DARPA, couldn't do it anymore. Okay. Uh, the, uh, uh, but, uh, you know, in during the 90s, they, they actually removed the D for a while, for a few years, and, but then they put it back. So, uh, and, yeah, let, let's, let's move to, you know, you, you also mentioned in, 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 in passing very quickly, you say the last 50 years of computer science research, you know, there are, there are awful things. They, they use old tricks and uh, try to 
So uh, that's yeah, not fair, I, is it? I, I, that sounds uh, not, it's not fair at all. A little bit uh, uh, discouraging, but uh, you know, but I, 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 you know, I still dare to ask you, how do you feel about uh, the the last sixty years progress in AI? Oh, well, I, that's easy because, again, if you're a biologist. Uh, and I used to be, and you know something about the hum way the human brain works. An enormously large part of every mammalian brain, in fact, most brains, are like uh, machine learning. They're basically quick correlators. And so a big machine learning system is kind of like a super pigeon. And you can get a lot of good things out of a super pigeon. And in order to do something right now that we would call real intelligence, the name AI got stolen. Now, now, we now it's called general AI. Okay. So this is one way of telling that things have gone very, very wrong. So uh, people, even, when, even in the last 10 years? With, no, when, uh, with, the people, uh, when the people are, who are doing it co-opt the name with a subset of the meaning to claim success. Okay. Why, do it? Why is it called AI? Well, people uh, wanted to have success, and so they decided to not work on the hard problems, which, of course, are the cognitive parts. And so the cognitive stuff has been very poorly funded over the last 40 years, really poorly. I'm speaking from the standpoint of the U.S. Okay. Because I'm and, aware. Yeah. Of and, you know, some people have worked at it one way or another. The, uh, the people at Vulcan Labs were looking at cognitive AI, uh, Doug Lennett of the Psych Project looking at cognitive AI, but and some people have started looking at now with this drive towards explanation uh, and drive towards having a user interface uh, that humans can deal with. That user interface, if it's going to work in human terms, it has to have a context similar to the common sense world that human beings have. Hardly any work has been done on this percentage-wise in the last 40 years. And so I think that the what uh, ML has done is impressive and fun and it's needed. But I wouldn't confuse it with real AI, not even a little bit. Great. Uh, well. At least you agree. You know, machine learning has uh, has gone you know through a tremendous progress in the last uh, ten years, and the deep yeah. learning uh, in particular. You know, now you, we we finally have some networks that can work, can solve problems. So, you know, now you have machines that can recognize faces uh, better than most of uh, uh, humans, yeah. and uh, uh, solve a lot of uh, uh, real world uh, problems. But do you have uh, 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 some uh, some thought on you know? And then let me come back to the, to the theme of the main theme of the conference here is next decade of AI. So, what's your prediction or yeah. expectation or your vision? You mentioned about well, vision versus goals. I think, I think the first thing is to take the term intelligence seriously, really seriously. Just like one of the problems uh, with the thing called computer science is that term science was taken seriously uh, in the 60s and the 70s, but now it means engineering, in the United States at least. If you talk to any computer science graduate student and ask them what their field is, they'll give you an engineering explanation, not a science one. So that, you know, another term that got co-opted is object-oriented. Hmm. That meant something in the 60s. And when it became popular because it was very successful at Xerox Park, everybody wanted it. And so an enormous number of languages started appearing that were called object oriented that weren't at all. See, this happens over and over again because people want to be successful. They want to feel part of the winning team. You can buy genes 
you know, jeans that we wear that have the Harvard logo on the back. Do you want to feel successful? <laughs> I'm, I'm in contact. Well, this is part of the brain. It's called okay. uh, the, the magic of contagion is these guys are successful. I want to do it. I'm going to claim I'm doing it. I'll just do a subset. So, yeah. So take it seriously. Draw a high threshold for what it means and don't worry about you know, quit writing papers on stuff that isn't interesting. One of yeah. the one of the reasons that ML got going, yeah, uh, I, is because of Cohonen uh, showing that uh, certain kinds of matrix math was equivalent to certain kinds of perceptrons. All of a sudden, academics could write papers with math in them. <laughs> If you, if you look at what that math does, it's not that interesting or impressive. It's basically a big correlator or as uh, Ju Judea Pearl, who I think is a guest of your conference. I hope yeah. he's a great guy. Uh, yes, he, yeah. he calls ML uh, curve fitting. <laughs> right. and so if you call it what it is, you might want to work on something more if you're working in the field of AI. If you're calling the little thing you're doing AI, even though it's using thousands of machine cycles and special chips and everything. But if you're only working on a subset, you can't claim anything interesting about the large field. So, you know, the main, main advice to, to give to any young researcher is, hey, get real. Don't worry about, yeah, there's all this bullshit. No question about having to write papers to get your PhD and having to do, look, the people who are going to make the breakthroughs here are people who just don't care about that. And uh, I, don't mind the, I don't mind the funders funding everybody else, but if the funders omit funding the people who can do the breakthroughs because of the orthodoxy of this stuff that isn't it, then it's a disaster. And I, okay. I think of a lot of what's been going on in computing the last 20 to 25 years in general as a complete disaster. Uh, great point. Uh, you know, uh, I, I'm sure uh, many audience have heard you. Uh, you know, the, uh, many in the audience has heard y your uh, advice, and I want to, you. You know, get put back your memory a little bit. You know, you 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 mentioned some very good point. You know, don't pay too much attention on paper publications and uh, papers, and today maybe citations, all those things. Yeah. You know? So one question I have for you is when you were at at, at the park. Right when you work, were working on this uh, graphic user interface, you know, and th there's not you know you people will argue there's not mu much mass in it, you know that that is not a use differentiation a differential uh, equation, and uh, and how do you convince your boss? Now, this is great work. This is going to be a breakthrough and it will change the entire interactive mode of computing. And uh, that will lead today, you know, uh, internet, uh, whatever, in mobile devices. You know, read the paper, look at my talk. I never had to convince my boss of one, not one thing. Because the, bo uh, the boss, who was Taylor, he just hired me and said, follow your instincts. That's the only Wait. direction. I, that's the, and Taylor never told any researcher at Park any project that he was that he wanted us to do never great great i uh, uh, 这个听众里面有没有, 有没有专门做管理的人啊, 呃, 记住这个老, 这个过得最好的人, no, i i was uh, re, re paraphrasing what you, what you, you just said in chinese uh, but then uh, let me follow up on this uh, same topic you know how do you then generally got your idea be accepted in the community <laughs> well, you know, that, that's more important, right? You know, your boss, you know, let you do whatever you want to do, but then how people are convinced that your stuff is great. Most, no, most of my ideas haven't been accepted in the community. That's okay. But there are a few, right? There are, you know, you're, you're what? Object oriented programming and the graphic interface. No. Those, no. those are the, the main things that are called object-oriented languages aren't anything like uh, how I described object-oriented. No, I lost on that one. 
because people awesome. thought they, people thought they knew how to program. And uh, the graphical user interface at Park, and that's an interesting, different talk, because we can run all of that software on today's machines. I give I give talks using the exact software from Xerox Park. In fact, that Steve Jobs saw, so people can see what he saw. And if I were to do it, you would be shocked at some of the things I can do that I can't do in uh, PowerPoint or uh, or Keynote. For instance, you could the whole thing was live. It wasn't a static presentation. The whole uh, every part of it was programmable, and every part of it was safely examinable. So none of that stuff is around today. So uh, no, what happened was. Uh, if you look at the, these technologies coming out of Park, yeah. ones where there was no competitor, even really opinion-wise, uh, those made it. Like an example of that, for instance, there was nothing like the laser printer. Right. Nothing. So companies started immediately doing that. There's nothing like the Ethernet. Right. Everybody had tried to do a local area net, but the Ethernet is the only one that ever worked. And right. so that was easy. Uh, people thought they knew how to program. So the new programming techniques and languages and stuff that we did at Park uh, were more or less rejected. And people adapted the user interface to a subset of it, partly because the Mac was so weak compared to the what we what we had in park that it could only do a, a part of the problem so what you're getting out is a subset the really sad thing to take a look at is how bad the web and the web browser is compared to the software of the 80s that was after again, 40 years after 40 years you still think so well the web web and the web browser go back to like 1993 so That's 27 true, yeah. 27 years, and in most cases, you still can't do WYSIWYG editing in the web browser. Right. That's pathetic. The web and the uh, the web was developed on machines that had WYSIWYG editing on them. So what you're seeing right. here is a vast subsetting and failure of people to do the work. Okay, uh, since we are on this topic, of the graphic user interface, right? And uh, you also mentioned that the object-oriented uh, programming idea, you know, people did not really take it, you know, people did it wrong, a different way, a wrong way. And so, you know, just, uh, just a little bit gossip, you know. So what do you appreciate that Steve Jobs actually stolen your idea and made it into math? You didn't steal, look, I, I told both Steve and Bill Gates, take the whole, remember we were developing the public Domain Xerox let us write papers. It wasn't right. a secret visit. I wrote a Scientific American article that was published two years before Steve showed up that showed the whole user interface and everything. Everything he saw in 79 was out in the world two years earlier. So there was nothing secret about it. Right. What I told these guys, both of these guys, is look, take the whole idea. Don't take a yeah. subset of it and mess it up. Take <laughs> no, people say stealing. I don't. You know, we're not. None of us at Park tried to get rich. That's a great by, point. By the way, to your point about you know, don't you care about X, Y, and Z? No, I I measure myself by the quality of the effort I put into anything. It's the only thing I control. Control. I can't control other people's opinions. Great point. Great point. And the second thing is that. The people at Park and in the ARPA community in general had an aesthetic com connection. We really, we really loved Licklider's vision. I mean, loved it like you love a lover. We really wanted it. It was an it was an emotional need that we had that we were called to it like people are called to religion or to being a doctor or to art. And right. So what, so what we, and the, the hiring, 
the selection process, Taylor was looking for people who were essentially artists who happened to have deep scientific uh, backgrounds. And like I said, there are, there are people like that. I was one of them. Many of the people at Park were like that. And boy, um, an artist might be a little disappointed if somebody doesn't like their painting, but not much. <laughs> Mm. Okay. Right, because that isn't why you're not painting it for to sell the thing. Yeah. An uh, artist, art is about. I, I have these feelings that I would like to manifest, so that yeah. other people can. That that's what you're doing. And if if you feel like you've done the highest quality effort you can possibly do on this work, what what more can you do? You can't let yeah. some. Okay, you know? I, I, I need to pull you back a little bit. You know, so uh, you you have you know uh, in park and in your in your in your career you have invented a lot of great ideas, uh, but there is a story. You actually went to visit uh, Y Combinator in in two thousand fifteen. You did a, a graffiti on their slogan. You know, they say <laughs> they will they will invent the product people want. And you you cross out want and put on need. So yeah. what is what was your thinking behind it? And well, uh, well, uh, go ahead. Yeah. Well, we want sugar. We want fat. We want salt. Uh, we want companionship. These are biological need, biological wants. They're drives. We want stories. So the way to make money is to make a technological amplifier for any human want. Because a technological amplifier in the industrial revolution creates uh, essentially a legal drug. Well, yeah. We have to have these things. We have to have these things. Uh, so yeah. let me just explain the last thing and then I'll quit. But what a need is, is something like education. Everybody needs deep education but many children don't want it. Marketing people hate the idea of needs. Marketing people want to sell to people's wants. Educators are trying to figure out what people need and they're trying to figure out how to help them gain this, what they need. But it's, it generally requires a lot of work to deal with a need and much less work to deal with a want. Okay. So, that our, so our society is, messed up in the overbalance between the fact that you can make easy money supplying need, uh, supplying wants, but it's gotten out of the habit of doing the work necessary to take on a new need, like learning lots of things you didn't know before uh, that are completely new. Okay, great. Uh, you know, uh, Alan, in the interest of time, you know, I, I need to stop here, but I want to stop with one last question. You you only have you know you only need to answer in one sentence, you know if you if you want to name one great product that you have seen in the last twenty years, what <laughs> that will be? <laughs> great product. Well, the most the most fun thing that can be found online right now. It's a company, it's probably going to be a product, but you can use it right now for free. Uh, so the most fun thing I think over the last 20 years in, in the computer realm is, uh, is called Croquet. Croquet is, this version is the fifth of five deep research efforts over the last 20 years to see if uh, uh, the thesis of Dave Reed at MIT in the 70s would actually work. So it is a massive, it's something that is as large as the internet and massive deployment of pseudo time computation. So this, this is up at the level of importance with TCP IP. Okay. Well, so, uh 
Alan, I, I have to cut off here. And uh, uh, again, I want to thank you very much for your enlightening talk and for uh, the interactions we have. And uh, I, I know we can chat like this for another hour or two, you know. And there are mm -hmm. also many questions from the audience, but uh, I have to cut it here. Well, thank you so much. And uh, hopefully next year in the BAI conference, we'll invite you to come in again and we can have another fireside chat. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, wait, wait for a bit. Alan, uh, in the room of the guests, we have closed the camera. Okay, everyone, put your camera down. Uh, Alan, just wait a few minutes. We, we, we want to... Oh, Alan. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we should take a photo. Yeah. So this is a virtual uh, way of taking photo yeah. together. 我看到朱小燕老师、贾佳、孙健，还有很多学者。姑娘，对对，我我还是想一定要问一个问题。哈哈哈哈哈！对，铁军选手举了很久了。您这位作为大会成员委员会主席啊，我给你这个优呃这个
for instance, one of the problems in graduate school today in the US is the fact that the housing market in the US has expanded an, an additional factor of 10 in cost over everything else by inflation. What this means is no uh, graduate student at Stanford can afford to buy a house in Palo Alto when they get out and get a job. They can't do it. They have to go to Google. And even there, it's hard to buy a house in Palo Alto. So the, the, some, almost nobody wants to stay in and do research. And if you stay in and do research, who is going to fund you? Well, not NSF, because NSF funding in computing is almost entirely like engineering proposal. You have to, in your proposal, you have to explain to them how you're going to solve the problem. <laughs> this is the proposal. <laughs> Whereas at, at ARPA, you would scribble something on the back of an envelope and say, uh, here's the issue I want to work on. And if they thought you were a good guy they would or a good gal, they would say, yeah, uh, that's... That was, was in a response to the question there. Yeah, nobody ever asked me to justify a, a single thing at when I was in grad school or at Xerox Park. They just, when I walked in there, they gave me the equivalent of a $2 million a year budget, and I was one year out of my PhD, right? So one year, but they thought I had uh, potential, and... No, if I stubbed my toe on the thing, well, I was just one of a bunch there. And the theory yeah, there was, the was uh, it's like going out on a, uh, in a farm. Yeah. What you're interested there is yield. Not yeah. every single uh, thing being right. You, mm. you're, you're growing everything as well as you can, but not everything is going to grow. And, no farmer cries about that. It's yep. part of the overhead of, and the same thing is uh, not succeeding in your research when you're doing this kind of research. It's not failure. It's overhead. It's the overhead. It's like in football, uh, the percentage of goals made by a football player is really low compared to the shots on goal, right? Missing a shot on goal when you're playing football, that's not an error. That's overhead. It's a difficult game. And you're willing to pay people immense amounts of money to uh, every once in a while score a goal in a game. That's the way it works. The sports world understands this completely because uh, what, you, what you're trying to do is something difficult. A big problem with bureaucracies mm -hmm especially large ones, is they are hiring so many people that they have to dip into the middle of the bell curve. So you're getting people that have to be managed. And all of a sudden, you have to start having layers. Good point. And you, point. Have, uh, you have accountability. Yeah. No, you're much better off. So in America, there's the American MacArthur Foundation. You probably heard of that. They have this thing called Genius Grants. So every year they give five years of support to 35 artists in some field, period. There are no goals behind it. It's whatever the artist does. It's just to get artists. Artists can't not do their art, right? That's the definition of an artist. So if you get somebody who takes direction in this area, you don't want them. Yeah. You absolutely don't want them because they're not following their art. What you want is to get the best art as you can get in there and take 30% of the result and be happy. Very, 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 very enlightening, uh, you know, uh, extension. And, uh, you know, uh, Alan, there, there is one thing I want to add on here is, you know, I look at through your 19 rules of, uh, you know, uh, uh, managing the uh, great, uh, uh, a lab or great research or ma managing mad money. I think you mentioned a number of them, you know, no control, don't control the control, don't mingle, don't, don't meddle around. And, and also funding people, not project. 
which yeah, is which is right. exactly what the PAI is doing. So we are not funding project; we are funding people, and uh, we are also funding young people. And we don't want people apply. We say you know, because you are good. Here's the money. So uh, uh, you know, so I I will remember <clears throat> next time when I get a challenge, I will say, you know, Dr. Alan K said that. Okay, thank you very much, you know, Alan, and uh, uh, I. You know, I will, hopefully, I will hope well, to, well, I will hope to be alive the next time this comes up. Oh, that would be very soon. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> bye bye. Bye. 好的，谢谢，谢谢 ，Thank you，Thank you, Thank you Alan， t h a n k you， 洪江 ，Thank you， 啊，呃，我们的志愿大会的整个的四天的议程啊，就到现在已经进入了尾声啊，我们一起呢有很多的这个主题演讲啊，有很多重量级嘉宾。我们也一起，大家很多听了可能听不过来啊。我们有数理基础的，有机器学习的，有软软硬件这个系统的，有这个框架的，啊，也有这个检索与挖掘，呃，然后呢，按领域方向的有感知智能，有决策智能，有认知智能，是吧？也有自然语言处理的。然后我们还有一个很特殊的环节呢，我们起源的 AI 的这个智能体啊，在星际争霸的这么复杂的一个场景下。打败了我们人类的高手，然后我们也共同探讨了在行业里头 AI 的医疗、AI 的交通、AI 的防疫和 AI 的创业。当然，还有很重要的方面，我们还探讨了伦理，还探讨了女性多样性的问题。当然，整个这个四天议程呢，我们一起回顾了很多过去十年，甚至更早。啊，我们也一起展望了。未来十年 ，AI 会发生哪些事情？呃，刚才 Alan K 有一个非常著名的名言啊，叫 “The best way to predict the future is to invent it”， 就是说，要预测未来，最好的方式是去创造它。呃、我们在座的，在线上的，可能大部分人都是从事跟 AI 相关的这个工作。AI 呢，确实是人类。下一个十年甚至更长时间，可能能够具有的啊、呃、最强大的工具之一啊、呃，所以我们有责任把这个事情用好，能创造更大的社会价值，也创造更大的产业价值。让我们大家一起努力，把这个未来美好的未来创造出来。